Was back in session. So if you can please. Um, Thank you for your enthusiasm and wanting to uh, converse with each other. That's awesome. Um, but we have a lot to discuss today, so we'll move forward and continue our discussion. The first item now is the presentation by the Punagoda Boaters Alliance on the Punagoda Waterfront Development Master Plan 2019. Mitch is trying to train me, uh, which is not easy. Uh, <laughs> good morning. John Welsh with the Puna Gorda Boaters Alliance. Beautiful day in paradise. And um, at the request of the City Council the last time that uh, we presented this, uh, we went back, gathered additional information. This plan now reflects additional input as we go through, and I'll go through it quickly because I know you've seen it before, but please stop me if you want at any place. So the vast majority of those contacted, and again, when I say those contacted, is the people we went out to, and I'll give you a list of those folks at the end of the presentation after the first, pre after the first presentation. While no significant changes were suggested, additions were made to the presentation as a result of the ideas offered. The historic uh, district homeowner association voiced several <coughs> concerns which are noted at the end of the presentation, which I'll talk about at the end. And I also will address some of the things that were brought up this morning. We're located in a great place, confluence of Peace River and Charlotte Harbor. The Puna Gorda waterfront has and continues to play a decisive role in the development of the city. We are a water activity, waterfront community. Boating community, Puna Gorda Isles, Puna Gorda uh, is a premier boating community, Burnt Store Isles, premier boating community. I mean, the vast majority of our citizens are on the waterfront in this community. It benefits all citizens, residents, residential areas and in, in commercial sectors. Money Magazine in 1996 and 2003 recognized us as a great place, one of the best small cities. Yachting Magazine, one of the 50 best yachting towns in America. Miami Herald, these waters are known internationally for fishing and sailing. And where to retire last year, one of the eight Gulf Coast beauties. We are a great community and the Boaters Alliance wants to make it great and continue to be great. Fly Master Plan. Let me just say, if we don't plan our future, somebody else will. And we need to be planful about how we use the limited resources that we have. Our mission was to develop and submit a master development plan to the city of Puna Gorda with regard to, but not limited to, the development and management of our waterfront. This plan will seek to establish Puna Gorda as the premier recreational boating community. Now, let me emphasize that boating community. Yes, we want to attract visiting boaters, but this is about our citizens and making this community the best it can be. The Boating Alliance, Boaters Alliance, is made up by many, many organizations. These organizations represent thousands of citizens in our community. And all of these organizations had input into this plan. We also have many advisors to our organization. Peace River Sail Power Squadron, U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Flotilla, so on and so forth. So this is not a plan by John Welsh. This is a plan by thousands of our citizens. The Puna Gorda Waterfront Development Master Plan to establish Puna Gorda as preferred destination for visiting boaters and support recreation and board boating in our community. So our, this is the plan. We know and support the continued redesign of Ponce Park, relocation of the, of the Peace River Wildlife Center, redesign parking, kayak launch, restrooms, pavilions, so on and so forth. Fisherman's Village Marina. There is an increasing shortage of slips 
and dockage in our area. And if you try to get a slip at Fisherman's Village right now or Lashley Marina, you're not going to get one. And in fact, last summer, there were so few slips available, Fisherman's Village had to cancel Marina Days. The Tunagarda Waterfront Hotel and Marina. Again, lack of slips. We recommend the city work with the city or with the hotel owner to rebuild that marina. It would provide additional slips, dinghy docks, restrooms, showers for visiting boaters, and be an inviting environment for visiting boaters. Four Points Hotel. Again, if the city can work with, and I know the city is not going to build the marina, but encourage the owners of these hotels to reestablish their marinas, it would provide additional slips, dinghy docks, restroom showers, and an inviting environment for boaters. Amenities for vo visiting boaters. Enhanced trash receptacles, uh, potable water access to boaters, establishment of Wi-Fi along the waterfront, which would also benefit our citizens, not just boaters. Showers for visiting boaters. And by the way, we are not proposing, and the reason we did not mention showers in our proposal is because we will not, we are not recommending the city manage this, but Fisherman's Village or Punta Gorda Hotel manage the morning ball field. They would provide the showers and so forth. And the visitor information center located near the water. The West Morning Ball Field. Establish a West Morning Ball Field that will promote tourism, provide the city with mechanism to manage and control anchorage off of Gilcrest and let me jump down to the bottom point, provide the city with the ability to manage the length of stay on mooring balls and provides additional dockage during high season. The state has finished its pilot program on the mooring ball fields. During the pilot program, they allowed cities to manage anchorage around the mooring ball field. As of yet, the legislature has not passed that regulation I would encourage the City Council, the Homeowners Association, and anybody else to petition the legislation to provide the city with a mechanism to manage the anchorage around an established mooring ball field. Day and dinghy docks, severely limited. Because of limited docks, we should work with the county to construct day and dinghy docks behind the Charlotte Harbor Event Center dinghy docks at the Four Points and Punta Gorda Hotel, and construct a break wall at Gilcrest Park to protect the dinghy docks that we have. Kayak launch sites, established sites at Ponce de Leon Park, east of Highway 41, and at Colony Point. This is a great activity. It's, a, it's growing and growing in popularity with our citizens. Boat club and waterfront buildings. The city should act on one of these three options. One, renovation of both buildings. Costs would be significantly less than replacing the buildings. Extended lease would allow the renter of the boat club to invest in improvements. A new facade on the exterior of the building would be a possibility. Update the interior, new restrooms and improvements. This would greatly improve their usability and improve curb appeal. Second option, Remove the buildings and replace them with a new structure. If you choose the first option, we recommend that in the next five to 10 years, this should be the goal of the city, to replace the buildings. Or you can do nothing, which we see as not an acceptable option. Collaboration and cooperation. Working with the Florida FWC and the US Coast Guard to ensure all boats are properly registered. And after meeting with the Historical Homeowners Association, Vice Mayor Matthews and I spent two, two and a half hours listening and talking with them, and we appreciated the input. We asked the police department to work with the Florida <coughs> Wildlife Commission and the Coast Guard, and they checked every boat at anchor off of Gilcrest Park. None of them were polluting the water, and all of them, all of them were properly documented and registered. Documented boats do not have to have a number on the boat. Enforce all regulations. 
and promote and, and co-sponsor safe boating courses. We think the city should promote this. Alternate access, complete the Buckley Pass. Dredging, we have already proposed that Ponce Inlet be dredged to seven feet simply because it's really only five and a half feet at low tide right now. It takes two years to get a permit, typically. We're proposing start now. Work with the county to dredge Alligator Creek because that is within the purview of the county. We need to have discussions with Sunseeker. We need to make sure a water taxi is established, it will promote tourism, and hopefully reduce the impact of automobile traffic once that complex is built. Boating events. We're a great boating community here. Great water, great <coughs> events that are already happening. Let's take advantage of those. Let's also develop more events to attract more people to come and visit our city. Marine Patrol. We need at least one full-time Marine Patrol officer in Punta Gorda. Right now we have a part-time Marine Patrol officer who gets pulled off to do street duty whenever there's a need. We need to assign a permanent officer to these duties and have them routinely patrol waters within the city limits. Marketing. Establish an enhanced ongoing campaign and city branding aimed at boaters and tourists interested in water-based activities in partnership with the City of Punta Gorda, Charlotte County Chamber of Commerce, and Charlotte County Tourism Bureau. Continued focus on infrastructure and environment. Manage and maintain harbor facilities by continuing developing programs for repair, reconstruction, and maintenance. Provide consistent and attractive signage, public access, improvement, and an information and maintenance program. Continue working with environmental groups to protect the environment, establishing oyster beds, living shorelines. Work closely with state, county, and federal officials to protect our water quality. Promote and educate citizens of Punta Gorda about the ecology and what each person can do to protect the environment. The waterfront, our most valuable resource. Proactive measures must be taken by the city, the county, the state, the federal governments. <clears throat> Proactive measures must be taken to manage and develop this resource, benefit our citizens, attract visiting voters and tourists, and benefit our commercial sector. Additional input was gathered during the last quarter of 2018 from the Puna Gorda Chamber of Commerce, the Burns Store Isles Homeowner Association, the Historic District Homeowners Association, the Puna Gorda Isles Civic Association, the PG Islanders Boat Club, and the Puna Gorda Sailing Club. So we have received additional input, and the changes that you see were driven by the input we received. Puna Gorda is a beautiful and neat, unique boating community. We need to plan our future, enhance the lives of our citizens, and protect our little corner of paradise. And let me just say on the items that, that were talked about, uh, taking out the dinghy docks. Is my understanding <coughs> that the belief is if the dinghy docks were not there, that boaters would not come ashore. I can tell you that's not true. They would come ashore and litter the shore with their dinghies. They would not just say, oh, no dinghy docks, I can't come ashore. I've sailed all over the world, and I tell you, most of the time, there's no dinghy dock. You just go ashore. Derelict boats. The city has no control over derelict boats. Derelict boats are the responsibility of the state and county governments. And right now, there is legislation being presented to the state legislature that will make it easier to deal with derelict boats, but the city has no way of dealing with any boats that are anchored in the harbor. A mooring ball field would give you at least the ability to control how many, how long people stay on mooring balls and push boats further back from the shore, they would have to be behind the mooring balls. Boat registration we've already talked about. You don't have to have a number on your boat if your boat is documented. My boat does not have a number on it. Mooring field. Um, east will not accommodate tall boats. 
Uh, they need additional dockage at Fisherman's Village. People want to anchor near Fisherman's Village in order to get water, pump out, and fuel. Bathrooms and showers, I talked about that. Those will be provided by whomever manages the mooring ball field. Cost of the mooring ball field will probably be paid for through grants. That's the way the east one was paid for. That was totally under grants. So it won't cost the citizens of Punta Gorda if we get grants and any additional tax money. And unsavory people, that was something that we heard when uh, we met with the Voters Association. If you got somebody nude on a boat, I agree with you. They don't need to be prancing around in their birthday suit. When I lived in Nashville, believe it or not, I had a neighbor that did that. He didn't have a boat, he just had a yard next to me. <laughs> So I don't know how you control that. Unsavory people, when specifically asked at that meeting, what incidents have you had in the recent past with boaters causing problems? None were mentioned. So those are my comments, and those I wanted to address the issues that were brought up. Do you have any questions? Um, council members. Lynn, you are, uh, you've participated with this group. <coughs> with the Punta Gorda Voters Alliance as our liaison, so I'll let you um, start the discussion. Thank you. Um, yes. I would like to just point out the fact that this is not a new plan. Back in 2011, the City Council approved and adopted a waterfront master plan from the Voters Alliance, uh, and this is merely an updated and tweaked and modernized plan of what was already approved by council in a previous year. So this is not something new. We didn't just create this out of the sky. We took what we already had and we enhanced it and we, we made it relevant. We added all the comments and feedback we received from all the different groups we met with. John and I have been working together now for close to two years. We've been working with all the different area organizations that are homeowners groups, boat clubs. We've received input at numerous Boaters Alliance meetings that I attend every month. Um, this is a compilation of all of the feedback and input that we've received from all of those groups to try to modernize this plan and make it relevant. Um, we had a committee that the City Council approved back in 2007, which was the Waterfront Development Advisory Committee. They came forward and, and got together with the Boaters Alliance and the Concerned Citizens Committee and all told they brought together a plan that we've already accepted. All we're asking for now is to accept this updated version of the plan and adopt it and hopefully move forward. It doesn't have to be all done today or tomorrow, but to hopefully move forward with adopting and, and implementing a lot of the suggestions that are made in this plan. This is ultimately a goal to, to make us a desirable waterfront destination for visitors and also for our local boaters to use our, our harbor waters and to make things better for everyone. We, we knew that there were some problems when we met with the District 1 homeowners group. We, we understood, we listened to all of their concerns. We immediately, that day actually, had, had the police department going out on a patrol boat with the FWC and stopping by every boat and introducing their se themselves, checking for registrations, checking for lighting, checking for pump outs to make sure nobody was discharging into the harbor waters. So we've, done, we've started that process. We've already removed two derelict boats that were uh, in our waters. One was crashing up on the shore in front of the, uh, the two buildings at Gilchrist Park and one was sitting at our dock at Lashley Park Marina. We're, we're working on those problems. We know we have to take act action because obviously no one else was. So we, we've been working on that, and John and I have been very diligent about following up on all of those concerns. Um, but you know, to have a mooring ball field and dinghy docks on the west shore of, um, of the bridges is, is extremely important because we would be able to have some control over who's out there anchoring in our waters. Right now, we don't have any control because the, the federal government mandates we, we don't get to tell anybody who gets to anchor out there. And it's not up to anybody that lives on the land side to <coughs> mandate who can and cannot anchor in our waters. So we have, we have some concerns about that, but you know we, we also need to be concerned about being a waterfront-friendly boating community. And if we're going to do that, which is ultimately the goal of all of the people who are boaters here, 
um, we, need to, we need to accept this plan and move it forward. So um, I do have more comments, but go ahead. Gary. Okay. I, I am uncomfortable accepting this as a plan in and of itself. I'm not uncomfortable incorporating this into the citywide master plan. And, that's and I'd like to say this for a couple of reasons. I think there's a couple of things that we as a body have to keep in mind. The statement that we are a, uh, a community, a voting community today is a correct statement. Of our voting districts, all but one of them are predominantly voting communities. However, if you look out 20, 30, and 50 years from now, that is not going to be the case for the city. And we, ha as a body even today, need to be cognizant of the development that's going to be occurring east of 41 all the way out to the airport. We've already passed ordinances within them that as soon as those parcels come in touch, Cheney Brothers is a good example. As soon as we touch their piece of property, they're committed to um, an annex into us, just as Walmart has re recently done. And these are not direct parts of voting communities. So we have to be very protective of, the, of those entities that we have today, which is the predominantly voting community, but we have to be very cognizant and aware of where this community is going to be going demographically and ge uh, geographically over the course of the next 20, 30, 50 years from now. And that's part of our responsibility. So this to me has to be only a segment of what the citywide master plan is and to take in that holistic encompassing of it. I always encourage and have been on record of encouraging any type of commercial development that is good for the commercial business of the city. So the idea of whether it's a fisherman's village or a hotel or both that want to step up and develop commercially with a, uh, a mooring ball and if that involves some appropriate type of private uh, government cooperation, albeit. But I don't want to accept this as a direct entity. My other concern with plans such as this, including with the one that we're doing now, as I've stated before, we did a, uh, Team Punta Gorda gave us this incredible gift a number of years ago. The gift was accepted, not owned. We did a lot of the things on that gift, but it was not considered a living document. Again, we, we heard, we've done this in the past, and this is an update of what we've done in the past. This should. The updating should be, in my, my perspective, in any type of planning, an ongoing process on our yearly or bi-yearly place. It shouldn't be on a start and stop, start and stop, because things are changing too quickly. And so uh, as far as the overall compass and the work of it, everything you've done, I, I applaud you and I support 90% of it without question and 5% and 10% of it I think is always, you know, that's not bad. I'm, better than the grades I got in college, that's for sure. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to go forward, but I just want us to be in cognizance that, yes, we are a boating community today. We will always remain a significant boating community, but our future as a holistic community is not going to be predominantly boating. That's just going to be the fact, fact. And we as an entity body need to keep that in mind. Thank you, Gary. Debbie? I have three concerns. The first one is, um, I, I understand that this represents a zillion people and that you guys really worked hard on it, but I don't understand why we are presenting it to the city three days before we're having a charrette that's supposed to deal with what we're going to do with Gilchrist Park. Um, I, I, would, I would say that we can accept it as it is as long as we give it to Dover Cole and say, here is what the boaters of our community want. But, you know, there's no dollars in here that tell us what this is going to cost. And, you know, are we obligated if we say, yes, we accept this? Then do we have to go out and try to find the money? Because, you know, we don't want to accept $150,000 unknown entity for signage. I can't imagine $2 million for a mooring field that we don't know. I just, there's too many unknowns. If we can say, okay, this is a wonderful representation of what our boaters want, then I would say, okay, I accept it. But I'm really not willing to turn Gilchrist Park into a marina. And I kind of see that Not willing, happening. I'm sorry, to what? Turning Gilchrist, the, the, bay, the, the waterfront along Gilchrist, into a marina. Uh, we are not proposing marina at Gilchrist. 
what we're proposing is a mooring ball field to put those boats that are anchored out there on mooring balls, those who don't want to go on mooring balls, would have to be further out into the river. And as far as cost, I agree with you. We're not here to say this is what the city should pony up and pay. We're saying this is what we think should happen going forward to protect our waterfront, protect our community. Well, I would, that's what I'm saying. I would accept it that way as long as we present it to Dover Coal in that, in that spirit. Yeah. And, and I would appreciate a call from those folks because we've heard nothing from them. And as a representative of every boat club in this community and the marine industry, you would have thought that those <coughs> folks would have been in touch with us to see what we're doing. I'm a little surprised we've heard nothing from them. Yeah, I'm concerned by that too, John, because I've, I've had a lot of people say to me, based on their presentation and based on some of the stuff that they've heard recently, that they still don't get that we're a waterfront community. So maybe this will do that. Only if they want to talk with us and only if they want to accept this. <coughs> you know, I'm, I'm concerned that it's been dead silence from that end when it comes to dealing with the people in the waterfront. Gary? We have the charrettes coming up. This is the perfect time mm -hmm. to to bring and participate in those charrettes. And I, I, I'm not arguing with what you're just saying, John. That's the time that we need to bring that forward uh, uh, to them. And as I the am signed up. Or, I, I, <laughs> I know yet. Try, trust me. I'm just saying, but that's the time that the, that the various citizens' communities mm -hmm. uh, should go. Because, like, as at the point I'm trying to make, this is a great entity uh, in addition to it. But the um, the ultimate citywide plan should be very much more holistic. And um, I think that the bringing this up in the charrettes will help bring that as one of the cornerstones of, uh, of, a, of a citywide plan that we need to develop. And, and I'll just make a comment relative to what you said. My district is not predominantly waterfront. My district is predominantly residential, not waterfront. Mm -hmm. um, so the really are only, uh, yes, I do have waterfront in it, yeah. but it's not predominantly waterfront. Right, yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. So you got a nice call. Uh, Jaha, I think you wanted to make yes. a comment. Um, one thing I just want to share, we can't forget that we've always been a boating community from the very beginning. I mean, we were more fishing and yachting before, so it's, it's become more recreational, but at no point in this city's history have we ever not emphasized our boating community. One thing I think we, um, I think it's a very good vision document, but I think lacking financial as well as looking lacking impacts is problematic in a sense that even looking at the density of even how many boats are in estuary, there's a point to which a certain amount of gasoline is problematic. But point being is that we are blessed as a city because we don't have a slum on the water. We're one of the few places where we've actually balance this in a manner that it's not been problematic. And my fear is that we're so enthusiastic we wanted to make ourselves like something of everybody else that we're not looking at us. We What we do not want to be is a home for boat dwellers. We do not want to be attractive. It took Sarasota 30 years to get rid of that many people. We're looking, Cape Coral could not hold boat races last year because there was so much pollution in the water that it was actually toxic. And I think that we truly have to look at um, the pluses and minuses in this in a very, very big way. I think this is very premature for us to actually say this is going to be our plan without really looking at real long-term impacts because we've honestly missed the boat. We're one of the few communities in Florida that do not have a boating problem. And that's part of, we're, we're only looking at the pluses. There's a whole lot of negatives that come if you don't check this correctly. And I will say from residents who do live along the waterfront, one, one thing I think we need to think about is that there's a reason why in PGI, why vessels cannot stay overnight. There's a reason why vacant docks can't be rented out. It's because there's a thought about the safety and security of the homeowners. We're acting as if those who live along the waterfront in this area here somehow don't deserve that same right to safety and security that other people have. I think that we need to understand that having random people in our neighborhoods is a problem. And I will tell you clearly, since a diggy dock has been there, people have actually, they feel less comfortable in their homes than they have them. And, and, this, is, and this is a reality that I, I truly think that if people come here, they need to spend money, rent a slip, Fishman's Village or Lashley, and I've spoken to the Army Corps of Engineers about the process of even getting more slips. There's, there's a fast track process. If you do it half acre at a time, we can do that. But I think personally, this aspect should be in the realm of commercial business. I, I really don't think opening up too much of our other space to rent just any 
random boaters, I just don't see it as being good for the city long term. I, I've, I've lived for 20 years on islands, and so I've seen the best and the worst of boating. It. So this is not like new to me in this respect. I've, I've been in places that have been wonderful, and I've been in places that have been absolutely terrible, where I've seen this done wrong, even to the point where even with this, we need to have a harbor refuge. If we're really gonna be a boating community that's gonna be a world-class place, we need a place where when hurricanes come, boats can go and hide. I mean, there's, I just think that we, this is, a, this is a wonderful vision document, but I think we really have to do a lot more when it comes to finances and a lot more when it comes to the positive and negative social environmental impacts which this can cause. I, I think it's a little premature for us to take this as is. I, I guess I have a question about um, I'm assuming you're talking about the mooring ball field not wanting to turn the, the coastline into another marina. Is that and correct? all the people that will be on the outside of it because you don't have to. You can because federal law. I mean, men, we're preempted. You can just have random. We all we want to do is expand the footprint so more and more people can just live on that outer rim of that. But, but if we do nothing, nothing, we're not going to put a mooring ball field in. We still have boats anchored out there. Those yeah. boats are unsecured. We have no way of regulating how long they stay, but with a mooring ball field, we can regulate how long they can stay on the mooring ball. Right, but not the people in the outer rim. We and still can't do that now. If we don't put a mooring ball field in, what are we going to do with those Well, boats? what we do, we move, we remove that dinghy dock and we support how it has been. People are able to do the Sandy Beach, they're able to do Fishman's Village, and they're able to do um, Lashley. I, 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 with all due respect, I think that is misinformation. It, it's just illogical to think if you take the dinghy dock out, nobody's going to come ashore at Gilcrest Park. No, it's not about that. It's about making it easy. We don't want it so people can just live in our city without paying anything and just live so here for eternity. The discussion today is really, a, you know, I, I know we're talking about a point within it. Um, our discussion item isn't whether or not to take out dinghy docks. It's really to talk about the plan yes. itself. And so. I guess I'm a little surprised because when I met with each one of you individually and presented this plan, mm -hmm. got feedback and incorporated that feedback into the plan, mm -hmm. and, and some of this is the first time I'm hearing this. Well, I, I will tell you myself, I, I mean, I very much was embracing what you're saying, and so I went much deeper. I'm talking about even going to the Coast Guard. I mean, I was even looking at, 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 at um, breakwaters. No, no, I very much was embracing the idea, but with further inspection, there were impacts which I personally had not considered. So I was with you. But in further inspection, even talking with the Coast Guard, then problems came in my mind about the potentiality. So what I'm saying is that we're not considering the other side. What we're looking at only is the positives. We're not looking at the negatives. And I think what we have to do pro proactively, if there are going to be negatives that could potentially come, we need to be able to have solutions that we can deal with those ahead of time. We're, what we're doing right now, we're not considering that this has negatives. What we need to do is think of all the pluses and minuses, and a plan is going to be a master plan really is going to be like this thick and it's going to have every aspect as much as we can possibly consider. And I then if there are issues, getting... we can then, then we can then go and ameliorate those things ahead of time. There's, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that this can't be. What I'm saying is that we've not considered that this actually has negative outcomes as well. And I think we need to have a, a holistic picture of the whole Thank situation. Thank you, Chaha. Yeah. Lynn, I think you wanted to make some additional comments. Oh. And then Gary, I'll come. Uh, I'll refrain. We've kind of got off the subject here. So. Yeah, I think that... The, the idea here is, and I, I will give a perspective on this that from my angle, um, having been the CEO of an organization, a nonprofit organization that presented many visionary documents to the city, it was really more of a, a community view of what we thought and what we were thinking at the time. Um, one of the things we, we presented was a waterfront master plan back in 2009. Eight. Eight? Um, 2008. Um, you're, you're right, it was in September, I believe, in 2008. Um, and, and it was a vision um, and um, that really talked about what we were thinking could be. And the city did take some action. Not everything was, was acted upon, but it was, a, it was uh, because of a particular cost or whatever. Um, but it was a vision. It was what the community was thinking at the time. And I think what this is, is a collection of what the community is thinking at the time. And um, uh, I don't see this as a document that is everything in it, once we accept it or whatever would be, we're gonna go down the list and implement everything line item by line item. But I agree that there are things that could be, you know, we, as we learn more and dig deeper into some things, um, but we may come up with a solution on some things. So I think that's, that's the beauty of this community is the collaboration and helping us and helping the, the government solve problems. 
And so I appreciate all of the community um, weighing in on this, and I agree that, um, uh, that this is a great item to add to the, the planning process next week, and looking forward to that. And I know that the, the boat, Panagoda Boat Club is looking forward to participating as well. So Gary, you had comments. You, you preempted me for the most part. I just want to say that I want to applaud the, uh, the, uh, the document as affording us the opportunity, and, it, and the timing is really actually impeccable, of forcing us to deal with the questions, mm -hmm. both positive and negative. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not going to talk too much further because I'm as guilty as John Howe when I get a, <laughs> uh, on something. But uh, I just say it should be part of our citywide national plan. Mm -hmm. This is only should be great questions for us to incorporate as we de develop what roadmaps that we want to follow. Mm -hmm. Lynn? Uh, let me just finalize by saying um, it was always our intent for this plan to be incorporated into the citizen's master plan. Mm -hmm. That was from the very beginning what, what our goal was. And we, we did present this several months ago to council with the hope that we could tweak it until we got to the citizen's master plan so it could be folded in. So that is definitely the goal. And I think that um, if, if there is input that is provided next week during the charrettes, then all the better. Maybe we can even define some of the costs of some of what, what we're talking about here. But we, we, need, we have been told by national travel writers that we are not a boating-friendly community. And the goal of, that, of this document is to change that vision. We, we need, if we want to encourage people to come to our city and spend money in our city as visitors, visiting boaters have to have basic amenities to come here, and, have, and there has to be a reason for them to come here. So that was the goal of the document. And, and by accepting the document um, as a council, <coughs> we can at least move it forward to the, to the charrette process next week. And I do, I, I'm very disappointed that Dover Cole has not reached out to the Boaters Alliance because it represents a, over 30 organizations in the community that are all boating related. Mm -hmm. So that, that's concerning to me. It's very concerning to me. Well, there are representatives from Dover Cole here today and perhaps um, after this meeting that they will have a conversation with John yeah. since John, you are here. Okay. So that would be, I think, a wonderful thing to, to be able to, to connect the dots, yeah. so. Um, do we so if we make a motion to, to what to accept, accept the plan? Accept the plan uh, and and uh, ask that it be incorporated into the, the planning process next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, okay. I'll make that motion. Second. Okay. I'll second. A second. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. I Thank appreciate you. the opportunity. Welcome. You're welcome. Okay, next item on the agenda. Thank you for the discussion. Uh, East River Wildlife Center, please, Sunday Road site. The uh, item here is to um, approve the lease between the city and the Wildlife Center. It's a 50 year lease uh, with a renewal term, a dollar a year. Uh, it's for city owned property off of Dundee Road adjacent to South County Park. The city has uh, no need for that property whatsoever anymore. Um, the lease basically talks about moving the hospital and the rehab area that the Wildlife Center has from uh, Ponce Park over to Dundee Road. It's uh, out of the way, and they don't need the, uh, that those facilities. They're not public-oriented facilities. They don't need them in Ponce Park, and you heard... Uh, Pat Campania talk about uh, what that enables the uh, mm -hmm. Ponce Park site to, to prioritize. Um, the Wildlife Center will be responsible for construction and utility hookups, whatever is needed out there. Um, included in the lease is that uh, the city will pay for the, uh, the uh, monthly utility bill. Um, and they have the proper insurance that they are gonna be required. The reason this is in front of you now is that uh, the Wildlife Center has to go in front of Charlotte County to get a rezoning. In order to do the rezoning, the county staff have requested that uh, a lease be in place between the city and the Wildlife Center prior to consideration of the rezoning. So even if you do approve it, if they don't get the rezoning, it's Null and void. Mm -hmm. Discussion items. Lynn. 
I think this is a phenomenal opportunity for all of us. We have a piece of property that is virtually useless to the city that we own. Um, I, th I think it's, it's a great opportunity for the Wildlife Center. They are a phenomenal resource in our community and they're invaluable in what they do for us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm all for this. I think this is absolutely a no-brainer. We should approve it. Um, Debbie. As somebody who's done raptor research or rehabilitation for over 20 years, I would like to say that I am thrilled that you're moving the hospital someplace where it will not be an interactive with people. Mm. Thank you so much for having the foresight to do that. Again, a no-brainer. Gary. I, just, I have a question I'd like to ask the folks at the Peace River Wildlife Center. Okay. Would it be my understanding if you were able to relocate this to this location that it would also enhance your ability to protect the animals during a storm event? Uh, correct. Crowley Stahl, Executive Director, Peace River Wildlife Center. Um, our intention with this satellite facility is not only to uh, move our rehabilitation and hospital services out of the park, but it's also our intention to construct a building that will serve as a housing unit for our residents in Ponds Park would a hurricane come and threaten that area. Would all council persons be allowed to volunteer their services during hurricanes? Actually expected and maybe required. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to add that to the record because I think that's also an important uh, accoutrement to this. Uh, yeah. to this I think point. this is um, a wonderful thing. I think it's a great plan. Um, and if you're able to get it done so that then when we actually get into the reconstruction of Ponce Park, you have a place to move all of your residents. The only question I have is on page two, item uh, under the agreement uh, where it says agreement to item C, pay for monthly water service and if applicable wastewater service. I have a concern of us doing that for nonprofits. We don't pay for the wastewater services for the Visual Arts Center, although we do lease the, the property to them as well. And I just, I, I understand in Potts Park we have some kind of a uh, arrangement, whatever that is now. Um, it may be different in the future once it's, the park is redone, but I just have um, a concern and I've had residents actually comment to me and make a, a concern just over that one item, that's it. And what I would like to point out as well is that there is not currently any sewer, city sewer service at that site. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to have to you know, speak with our engineers and do some ground testing and find out what sort of um, drainage system or sewer system would be applicable for that site. We are more than willing to put in um, a septic system if that follows what the city's goals are um, for you know, the future of that area. Um, so at this point, the only utilities uh, would be the city water that we would be looking for the, the, the city to pay for. Um, but again, that is negotiable. It's not a deal breaker. I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem at all. I want to see this happen. I think it's it's going to be invaluable for all the, the value that you bring to the community. And uh, you've always been very, very um, frugally <coughs> responsible as far as the water and, and sewer at the, at the city park. So I don't have a problem with that. I, I don't think we're, we're talking about an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, I move that we go forward. Second. Uh, there's been a motion and a second to approve the Peace River Wildlife Center lease on Dundee Road site. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, the same sign. Aye. Motion carries four to one. Congratulations. Thank you. We look forward to the new location. All right, citywide master plan, economic recovery, economic and budgetary analysis, initial findings. I'm sorry. Mitchell, you're up. What? Uh, who was the May vote? Thank you. Uh, for the record, Mitchell Austin, uh, yes. urban design division. Uh, we have with us uh, representatives from our consultants. 
for uh, the citywide master plan project, and they will be. Mitchell, could you talk into the microphone? Excuse and me. louder, too. They will be presenting <laughs> our initial <laughs> findings for the budgetary and economic analysis. I think we these high tech new microphones need to be replaced. We need to get rid of these. <laughs> yeah, these are really. We can the Phones are the worst thing we've ever done. I'm Who's sorry in charge to say, of that? I cannot. I can't hear on these uh, microphones. Who, what department, Howard, is in charge of these microphones? <laughs> IT is aware of it. If people would speak up, we could hear. <laughs> it's, please. It's more than that. We, we will, yeah, we are looking at it. Okay. We are looking at it. Hi. For the record, uh, my name is Louisa Leite. I'm the project manager at Dover Coleman Partners working on the citywide master plan. We're here to present the initial findings of our economic and budgetary analysis. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. I just wanted to start with a quick overview of our timeline and process thus far. This is our team. Like I mentioned, I'm Dover Cole. We're leading the urban design and land use, public engagement. We also have here Anita Morrison, uh, founding principal of PS, Partners of Economic Solutions, who's been working specifically on this analysis. Paul Planning and Engineering It will also be at the Charrettes next week, and he is our transportation engineer and planner on the team. So just an overall timeline of the process. Right now, we're just in the beginning of March. We're presenting to council these findings, and next week we'll be back for the charrette. The goal is to have a first draft of the plan right around the end of June, and then move to a final plan by the end of August. She's speaking. Are you doing? No, she's not. So uh, as you can see, today is March 6th. We are here presenting to council. Like I mentioned, we'll be here next week, all week talking to everyone. Um, we'll have a big kickoff and hands-on <coughs> design session on Monday, two sessions, one in the morning and one in the evening. We will also have an open house to discuss concepts for the Boathouse site and the Bayfront Center in Gilchrist Park, specifically on Wednesday evening at Charlotte High. We'll also have open design studio between Tuesday and Thursday when everyone can stop by and talk to us and give us their feedback, sit down, talk over uh, any specific issue they have and to give additional ideas. Um, and then Friday, we will reconvene and present our initial findings uh, back to you all and, and see what the reactions are. So that's just a quick overview. Um, John, feel free to stay. I can talk to you afterward more about specifically the, um, the waterfront master plan. So I'd like to introduce Anita Morrison, who will be talking to you about the initial findings. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let me just emphasize these are initial findings. It is a preliminary report, but it was important that we um, provide a basis, a foundation for the charrette to make sure that everything is, is market-based and realistic as we do the designs and the concepts uh, and to provide some guidance and some feedback about the implications for the city's fiscal health. Um, from some of the decisions that will be made or, or recommendations that will come out of that uh, analysis. So we started with an overview of the economy and looking again at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, which is sort of a classic approach to um, evaluation. Uh, I think clearly, you know, the charming community with the hometown feeling, you've experienced steady growth in the population. Uh, the migration um, statistics show that 9.5% of your population migrates into the county each year. Um, so you're constantly renewing the population and, and um, growing along the way. So <clears throat> again, as a retirement community primarily and voting community, we see, you know, a fairly high median age of 66.3. It's quite a bit higher than the statewide average. High home ownership rates, 83%. Good uh, median household income, almost $60,000, and um, net worth of over $300,000 for uh, local residents. So that's a, a strong financial and uh, economic base for the community. Looking specifically at the business community in, in particular, um, there are great strengths in the walkable downtown, uh, the local and independent entrepreneurs that uh, populate the downtown, wonderful programming, the festival events really create activity and um, economic uh, growth for the community. 
and then the historic district provides you with that unique sort of authenticity. Unfortunately, the, the, those strengths of being such a great community for tourism and for retirement is also something of a weakness because it means that you're very dependent on retirees and tourism for the economy. And that's, um, as we look at the nature and the structure of the um, economy, the uh, Bureau of Economic and Business uh, research at the University of Florida says that you're the le second least diverse economy in the state. So that's um, that that's a little concerning, of course, because what that means is that you have a high share of the jobs that are um, low wage. They're focused in retail, leisure, and hospitality, and then in certain aspects of healthcare um, are also low wage issues or low wage jobs. It is a highly seasonal business um, community, and so that um, is a challenge to the businesses that, um, that cater to this population. And one thing that we saw um, in evaluating the downtown is something of a lack of critical mass. There is a good core of retailers. It's not enough, though, to really cement your, your role as a center of the region, and so we'd like to see that expand. Um, that's not likely to happen in and of itself. It needs, the downtown needs more attractions, more activities, more generators, and more residents in order to create the base for expanding that um, business community. Uh, but we, we are concerned that the, the lack of diversity makes you susceptible to economic shocks. Of course, so the um, economic downturn directly affects tourism and, and does affect your budget as well. Moving on to the residential side, <clears throat> one of the issues is the, um, the focus of your housing products and the, the single family attached or detached um, means that there aren't many multifamily units, there aren't many rental units available in the market. Um, the high pricing on these homes means that young families are often crowded out of the housing market, and that makes it hard to attract and retain younger workers. So as we looked at commuting, only 9% of the people who work in the city actually can live in the city or do live in the city. Um, and so that's, um, that's a concern for local businesses who, who need to find and, and hold on to good people. That opens us up to some opportunities. Um, there are a lot of um, smaller sites available for good infill housing. We're certainly seeing um, a growing interest across the country in housing that's in mixed-use communities where um, the amenities are close by. You can walk and bike to those, and so we'd expect to um, have some opportunities for greater downtown housing and for um, close-in housing in particular. Um, and we'd be looking to uh, create and take advantage of this walkable environment so that we can reduce some dependence on auto commuting. So uh, what we were asked to do uh, as well was to consider what are the opportunities from a market standpoint for the community going forward. So we focused in on the next um, 10, 11 years, and these are the city level um, opportunities for 150 to 250,000 square feet of office space. The retail market is in a state of flux nationally uh, with Amazon and all the online um, shopping. We're seeing bankruptcies and closures of a lot of retailers in, in their storefronts. You're actually in a better position than most communities because so much of your retailing is um, restaurants and sort of high touch um, personal relationships between the shopkeeper and the, the customers, that is part of an experience that you don't get online, and that's very important um, for your long-term stability. But it does suggest that there may be some limits as to how much you should be growing the retail um, community or retail base in the shorter term in the, ne in the next 10 years. The hotel market is a strong one it, um, that responds to the appeal that you have. 
the main challenge though is the Sunseeker Resort across in Port Charlotte will pretty much um, soak up the demand for what would otherwise be downtown hotel rooms and so it may take some time to stabilize that that market so we would suggest that in the um, next decade that you're probably looking at one or two hotels probably more in the Jones Loop area rather than downtown because of the the Sunseeker um, competition on the residential side uh, there's probably opportunities for six to nine hundred new single-family units we suggested about 300 to 400 multifamily rentals. Again, that's responding to the need of your workforce to live locally and to give you a little more balance between the owner and the renter population. And then 300 to 750 condominiums, depending in part on how large, how quickly your um, seasonal use grows relative to the year round um, population. The city, on a fiscal, the fiscal standpoint, of course, went through major um, issues with Hurricane Charlie, and then to be hit right after you um, almost recovered from that by the great housing crisis and the, the Great Recession put great strains on the city's budget. Um, your tax base, your property tax base, fell by 35 percent from its peak in 2008 down to 2013. You've been growing back, but you're still about 11% short of where you were in 2008. 